Hello and welcome once again to the Modern Maker Workroom. This will be our final installment of the doublet construction series. This 10th video will take you through placing the lining, basting it in place, setting the sleeves, lining the collar, making the buttons, and doing all of the general finishing of the garment. I'm really excited that we're finally reaching the end of this project and I look forward to showing you something new. Thanks so much for joining us. Now let's get stitching. We begin by laying the garment flat on a hard surface and taking a mallet and beating the seam allowances where they join in at the skirt. And what this does is flatten out the seam allowance and enables us to have a little bit more of a, a, a flat edge and it reduces bulk so that it's more comfortable to wear. In this step, we are basting the center front lining to the center front edge in preparation for stitching. Now, um, because we still have to line the collar, this basting is starting about two inches below the actual cut edge of the top of the lining up there of the collar. You can see near my right hand at the top of the image, you can see the pad stitched canvas for the collar. So you begin about two inches down to leave that area free and open so that when you're stitching the collar lining later, we have easy access to the interior and all the seam allowances. As I was basting down my front lining, I realized that I hadn't fully tacked the seam allowances at the center front where they join onto the skirt. So I pulled the lining back and now I'm stitching these in place. The seam allowances are secured tightly and now I am uh, tying in my thread, getting ready to work my felling stitches along the edge. This uh, isn't going to be particularly tidy, it's going to be very functional and I just want to get everything in place so that the points of the skirt lie properly uh, after the doublet's closed. With my little detour complete, uh, now we're back to finishing the basting of the center front. And uh, we'll just keep going here. And the transition is very simple. It's just folded up and the turn is made. And then the basting continues on across the bottom. See, there it is. I show my back stitching there that's holding the skirt in place. And I fold the lining under get it to line up properly with the waist stitches. Now I'm going to try to make sure that I cover the back stitches that are used for this seam so that I have a nice clean white interior and you're not seeing dark stitching poking out from underneath. Okay we finished basting along the bottom of the lining and now we need to baste the uh, the cut edge of the seam allowance into the body of the garment let the raw edge fall inside across the seam allowance and then we take very shallow stitches only into the canvas to baste it in place and these stitches don't come out they're permanent so make sure that they don't go through to the outside and in the same way that we left the top of the neckline free by about two inches we are going to leave the top of the armhole free by a couple of inches and that will allow us access to the seam allowances so that we can set the sleeve in and stitch it in place and then finally close the lining very nice and tidy around all of the allowances so that it's a clean finish inside the garment. So working with this area I'm looking at the armhole and I'm noticing that the wool of the back padding goes all the way to the cut edge. And I have a very bulky, woolly, pl uh, plush sleeve that I'm going to backstitch into this. And that sleeve even has some gathering. So what I don't want is to have too much thickness involved in this area. So I'm cutting out a wide portion. This is almost three quarters of an inch that I'm cutting out here. And um, what will end up happening is as the seam is sewn, the allowance, the seam allowance is actually about half the size of the area that I'm shaving out here. And what'll happen is the seam allowance will get turned and the edge will end up stitched down to the wool.
and it'll nest very nicely and be a little bit flatter. Now that I've trimmed that out, I'm working my way up to the shoulder and I want to join these two pieces of wool together. And you'll notice that I'm sort of doing this in harmony with stitching the lining in place because I'm working my way around the garment. So as I go, I'm closing up and finishing all these little bits that have been left along the way in different stages of completion. And this is, this is sort of the way to dance around the garment and, uh, and just basically touch all of the different places that we've left unfinished. And here we are, I'm using a cross stitch technique to join the two wool layers together. And I have my fingers underneath controlling the surfaces and making sure that I don't uh, have anything puckered. I'm trying to make it lie nice and smooth. I'm trying to uh, make sure my stitches don't go through to the outside. And I'm also trying to make sure that once the garment's turned right side out, there's pressure between these two layers that sort of holds the shoulder out a little bit. Right there, you can see the little slash that I put into the wool way earlier in this video, in series of videos to allow the shoulder to be stretched and spread. And now that, uh, that little slash is just lying there. And it's fine to just leave it open like that. You don't need to stitch it closed. It's not going to go anywhere. You won't damage it or at all, at all by um, leaving it open. So stitch all along and close all the way up to the neck. And then we'll repeat the same process on the other side of the garment. Next, we'll move to the opposite side of the garment and we'll baste this front lining in place. Now, I'm not going to show you all of this because I've already shown you these techniques in the previous side of the lining, but I want you to see I start two inches below the armhole just as I ended on the other side so that I have access to the area for when the sleeve goes in. What I will have to do in a moment, though, is we have to finish the bottom of the buttonhole band in order to finish closing the lining around it. So in this segment, I'm going to show you where we are at the bottom of the buttonholes. Now this piece of silk is what we backed the buttonholes with and we have to hem it in place. So we're gonna turn the corner under and then fold the bottom edge allowance under. And then we're just going to use a felling stitch and put this in place. Now you can baste it in place if you like, I'm very confident with what I'm doing, so I'm just gonna go ahead and stitch it with the hopes that it doesn't shift or move or anything. As I work, I'm just making sure that I keep the stitches even. I'm trying to hold the silk in place. I'm trying to keep it in line with that little bit of the seam that you can see coming around the corner there. I'll turn the corner and I'll take just a few stitches along this edge until I run into my previous stitching and then I will tie off and finish. So what I'm doing here is I have pulled the allowance back to just behind the buttonholes where it belongs and I'm just finger creasing a line so that I have something to work against. So now that I've got where I want it to be, I'm going to trim away the excess because we really don't need to have this floating around inside. It's never going to be necessary to have more of the allowance than, you know, about three quarters of an inch to turn back. So I'm cutting it away. Now I'll fold the lining the other direction. So I'm folding down just the bottom edge and then I'm going to turn up the bottom hem. I'm going to get this in place here, and instead of basting it in place, at this point, I want to get moving forward, so I'm just going to start stitching with real stitches and work my way all the way up the buttonhole band. So we'll begin here. I'll use felling stitches all the way, and again, I'm trying to take these quite shallow, but small and firm. Now that the bottom is complete, we're turning the corner and we're going to begin hemming our way up the buttonhole band at center front. And again, I'm making the stitches very small, I'm making them close together, I'm making them snug, and I'm trying very hard not to go all the way through the fabric. 
I'm only going through the silk and the canvas that's beneath it. Now I'll try to stitch this really quickly and make sure that uh, I get done in a timely manner. And once we're done with that, then we'll move on. We've reached the top of the buttonhole band, and now we're at the neckline again. And you can see that we've just left this piece of bias hanging here, and we'll have to hem the lining in on top of it. So we don't need the excess at this point, so we're going to cut off what we don't need. We're going to leave a little bit of an allowance. Just It'll just hang loosely up into the neckline, and as we stitch different linings in place, the collar lining and the body lining, this will just get nailed in all on its own. We don't really have to worry about it too much. It will get stitched as part of the natural process without focusing on it. So if you followed our pattern making instructions correctly, you should have a notch at the bottom of your armhole and a notch at the bottom of your sleeve. Now you may have moved these one direction or another uh, when we tried the sleeve on and did a test fit to see if everything was going the right direction. Uh, so now we're going to begin at the bottom and we're going to start basting this in place. Now I'm just basting from the bottom up to the seams, both foreseam and hind seam, and that's where I'm going to stop because between those two seams is where all the gathering should go. So before I go too far, I just want to stitch a little bit, make sure that it's nice and secure. And you can see from these images, I'm actually stitching this basting line quite a bit um, further in than where my actual stitching line will go. So the basting line is about three quarters of an inch to an inch inside from the cut edge, where the seam itself will probably be about three eighths of an inch in from the edge. Now, that 3 eighths of an inch will vary depending on the size of your pattern. If you've drafted using the bada method, the seam allowance is supposed to be half of the dedo from your um, chest tape. You can see here where the mark is on the armhole where I need to align the seam, and I'm reaching it. I'm a little bit off, so I'm easing down just a tiny bit, but the rest of it will come out in the gathering that's far enough. So at this point I'll secure my thread and then I'll move around to the other side of the armhole and work my way back down into the armpit. I have aligned my hind seam with where it needs to be and now I'm again basting my way back down into the bottom of the armhole. Now these basting stitches will be removed after the stitching takes place, so don't make them too small, don't make them too tight, and certainly don't put a lot of energy into back stitching the ends of them because you want them to come out easily. And as I reach the bottom of the armhole, I will, here I am right here right now, I'm done, I'm just going to take an extra stitch and then I'm going to clip it off. As I load up my needle here with the thread, I'm going to talk a little bit about how this works. So I'm threading up with a double strand of a heavy thread. What I'll do is I'll go into my sleeve and then I will start stitching a gathering thread using the doubled strand. And I'll begin at the right and I'll work my way to the left. And then I'll pull up the gathers until they fit in the space between where my basting starts and stops. Then I will backstitch my way using the same thread. I'll backstitch across all of the folds and wrinkles, the gathers from the inside of the garment. And what this does is it secures them in a different way, which makes them sit more beautifully on the outside. So you can see here now I'm starting the gathering stitch, and it's just a running stitch. There's not um, a predetermined, carefully measured cartridge pleating concept here because I think that that manner of gathering up a skirt didn't really appear until the 18th century. Um, what we read as cartridge pleating is actually just uh, a hand run gather. And we can make the stitches larger or smaller depending on how much we need to pull in or how prominent we want the gathers. If we want um, finer less fluffy gathers, then we will use a smaller stitch. If we want larger, more prominent folds, we can use a larger stitch. 
in any case, we are going to run our stitches all the way through here, and then we'll draw it up and start our stitching. At this point, I'm done with my gathers, and I'm beginning the back stitching across the gathers at the top of the sleeve. So you can see that I'm now beginning to work left to right. And as I work, you can see I'm grabbing with the needle and just pulling a little fold of gather over and then stitching around it as though I'm just trying to nail down the fold itself. And what's really happening is that my needle and thread are going through the face of the fold and actually stitching the face of the fold to the fabric behind it. It's a little bit upside down and slightly counterintuitive, but the end result is a much more beautiful hand-sewn gather that looks more regular and is more easily controlled than simply trying to shift the layers wherever they belong. And this way, you're focusing on each individual fold, sometimes two at a time, depending on uh, how tight your gathers are. But with a closer look here, you'll be able to see more what I'm doing. So the tension in the thread's already there. All I have to do is just slide a little bit of fabric over and stitch around it. And I'll keep doing that little bit by little bit, and I'm making sure to go through all layers as I'm doing this. It keeps it strong, and it keeps it um, even. It's not going to look super pretty on the back side, but pretty is not the point. Strong is the point. As you work and as you uh, get practice into your hands, the reverse of the stitching will look better, but this type of gathering and stitching never looks glamorous at all on the other side. Looks pretty good on the side where the gathers are though. You can see it starting to form and how evenly distributed all of those folds are. If you look right under my thumb as I'm as I'm stitching. So we'll skip ahead here until the point where we're done with the gathers and then we'll begin typical back stitching to go around the rest of the armhole. The gathers are complete, and now I've moved back to the left end of where all the gathers started. It's where I began my stitching of all of the little pleats. And I now have a single strand of heavy thread. Since I'm not working with gathers anymore, I don't need anything strong. And now you can see I've returned to traditional back stitching, where it's going right to left, and we're just working along at our seam allowance width. Now, just due to the nature of the pattern shape from the time period, we have a little bit of an odd shape at the top of the side back seam, or, or the hind seam of the sleeve, and we're going to just blend a little bit away. You'll probably see me trim some away here in a minute. Uh, and that's just to keep the edges flush, but the, the, the line isn't as clean, so we just blend past it. I typically don't like to do that kind of work. I like to make the pattern very precise. But when the pattern is following a, a pretty precise period shape, sometimes the seams get a little, um, a little wonky and you have to trim away a bump or a, an issue. So you can see the seam allowance has a little bit of a jog right there. So I'm just going to work around that as I cross this seam and um, keep the stitching in a nice even line. I'm almost entirely around the armhole now. The gathers were secured first, and now I backstitched my way around the bottom of the armhole and up the other side. Uh, sorry, at this point my hands are a little bit out of frame. They'll move back in in just a moment. This backstitching, um, it takes a lot of hand strength. At this point you're going through two layers of canvas, two layers of wool, plus one layer of linen lining. Um, and not only does that require some decent hand strength and stamina, but it also requires a very sturdy thread. If you look really closely at my thread in this image, you can see that already, even though I've only gone just a few inches, this thread is starting to abrade and become slubby and sort of irregular. And um, that means that the best choice is to use shorter lengths of thread so that you have stronger thread and you have more joins in the thread. That way, if the seam should ever break, you only have to worry about a small portion ever coming loose, if it even does, because backstitching is so strong, it's nearly impossible to rip out. So 
um, the quality of your thread uh, is really important and using shorter lengths is very wise. So now that the seam is complete, I'm launching directly into removing the basting that's holding the sleeve in place. And that way, I can turn the sleeve to the right side and have a nice look at what I've achieved in terms of gathering and stitching this nice strong seam. The basting is out, and now I'm turning this right side out so that I can have a look at what I've created here. We'll see these beautiful full fingers of gathers. They're very carefully stitched and um, you can see they're tightly packed and they're very strong and the seam looks nice and clean. It's so important for that seam to be strong because those sleeves have to be there for a very long time. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and start the second sleeve and um, with the magic of video, I'm going to jump ahead to the next step, which will be lashing the seam allowances down so that the linings can be hemmed in place. With the sleeve sewn in place, now I have to secure the seam allowances down. And this means that all the allowances get turned toward the body, the, the more typical construction that I've seen in period garments and surviving garments in museums is that the seam allowances are turned toward the body, not into the sleeve the way we do in modern clothes. Now, there are extant garments where the sleeve seam allowances have been turned into the sleeve and secured in place. Uh, I would be curious to know whether some of that were, were poor reconstructions executed in the 19th century. Either way, in order for these allowances to be sewn well, we have to clip some of these tighter curves. Because in the pit of the armhole and at the front of the armhole, you're dealing with straight grain in the canvas, which is very tight. So you have to clip the body side of the seam allowance. You really don't have to worry about clipping the sleeve side. And in fact, since the sleeve is going to be on top of the body allowance once it's turned, it's better to have the solid one on top where you can stitch. The clipped one will be on the bottom after it's turned over onto itself. So I'm loading up my linen thread here, and the majority of this will be very easy to stitch because I'm only going into the wool, the padding that is right next to the seam allowance. And if you recall, when we trimmed it away, we trimmed away this wide amount, um, and that allows the thickness of the seam allowance, particularly where the gathers are, to just lay down neatly into the crevasse, and um, then you can just stitch it down onto the wool. So I'll uh, give you a minute or two to watch this, and then we'll move on to the next step. We are approaching the gathers, and I thought that I'd just talk a little bit as, uh, as they're stitched. So you can see that I'm having to take slightly smaller whip stitches here, uh, securing it to the wool, because there's so much fullness in the sleeve gathers, I have to catch more pieces of fabric to keep it uh, in place and keep it secured. Um, especially going over the shoulder seam, the shoulder seam is going to be so thick, because if you recall, all the allowances were turned toward the back when the shoulder seam was sewn. So with the trim and the gathers and the canvas and the wool padding, there's so much material right here that needs to be stitched in place. So once we're done with that stitching and we've got the seam allowance all secured, we're going to have to hammer this section with the mallet in order to flatten it out and make it thin and force it to um, lie as flat as possible. So I'll keep stitching here. I'm almost out of thread, so, um, oh, well, there it goes. Anyway, I'll clip that off, and then um, we'll move on to the next step. Okay, the allowance is fully secured. I have my little bench. This is going to rattle the camera. I'm sorry, it's just the way the floor is made. You can see how hard I'm having to hit that to flatten it down. This is a really important part of making good uh, period costume. 
In fact, most professional shops I've worked in, there's always a hammer going at some point to pound a seam allowance into submission. But you can see now, like the the hang of the sleeve seam allowances is beginning to look much more like garments that you see in museums. The way that the gathers fall out of that uh, armhole is so indicative of a historical garment. So now I'm going to stitch the other side, and uh, I'll just do that quickly, and we'll move on. Now that the sleeves are in, I'm going to turn my attention to finishing the top of the collar and inserting the collar lining. So here we have a plain strip of bias silk. It's the same silk that we've used everywhere, and it's a two inch wide uh, strip or five centimeter strip that we've folded in half and pressed. Now I'm going to take my collar uh, and I'm going to be basting this in from the outside, and that is so that I can keep an eye on how much of this piece of bias is actually exposed. Once it's in place and once the collar lining is stitched in, one of the last things I'll do is I will um, clip the edge, the folded edge of the silk, and um, create the little Picadill strip. The basting stitches that I'm using here are having to go all the way through the fabric to get to the silk. Um, so they appear short on top and long uh, underneath. And I'm trying to keep about three-eighths of an inch or, you know, about nine millimeters of silk visible above the edge of the collar. And this little piece of silk, once it's snipped, it will sit really nicely either under the chin, thus protecting the wool from abrasion from a beard, uh, but it also will give a place to pin a ruff or a collar to to help arrange the folds and keep it from shifting out of position. And here at the end you can see I'm just taking an extra couple of stitches. I'm keeping the finish about three quarters of an inch in from the folded finished edge of the collar and this will enable me to put the lining in and keep the Picadill strip from blocking um, the overlap where the buttons go. So I'm just slicing this off here. I'm going to do the same on the other side. And then we'll move on to doing some heavy, more permanent stitching on the inside of the collar. Because this basting was just so we could get it in place to be able to see the same width of bias across the top. But now I'm on the inside and I'm going to be using small regular stitches uh, to stitch this in place. And then eventually the basting stitches will come out. But I'm putting these pretty close to the top where the fold is so that I can um, line the collar lining up with them and stitch through to the actual exterior of the garment. Not that outer surface, but to the outer shell with the seam allowance folded to the inside. So now we're almost done uh, stitching this in place. And once I do, then we'll move on to the next step. And that's going to be measuring to put the collar lining in place. And we'll do that with our chest vara tape. So get that ready, and let's make a collar lining. The way we're going to calculate how to make the collar lining is to lay the doublet down on the table like we have here. Then I will take my chest tape, and I'll put the zero end there, and then I'm going to shift it down one dedo because that allows me a seam allowance on either end. It gives me some uh, room to maneuver as well. And then I'll go all the way to the far end of it. And if I've measured correctly, it's going to be about IIM in length. So that's two dedo less than half of the bada. And that's typical, that's how, that's the size this collar usually ends up if you followed all of the proportionate drafting. So knowing that, I'm now going to take this piece of silk, I'm going to um, fold up a little bias corner of it. Now, a lot of the period linings were not necessarily done on the bias. Many of them that survive in museums show that they were done on the straight grain. 
I like to do them on the bias because I think it helps me sculpt and mold it into the neck a little bit better. But it, it is, uh, it, it's definitely a period practice. It just may not be as common. So now that I've got the measurement, I'm going to measure for the height, which um, sadly has fallen out of frame here. But, uh, you know, it's probably going to be somewhere in the realm of about one-eighth of a bada, or O. And knowing that, then I can calculate the height. I'll add in some extra for seam allowance, and then uh, I'll cut it out. Oh, here we go. So, yeah, so about O, maybe OI will be a nice length, a nice height for the collar, and that'll give me a lot of room to maneuver and work. Okay, I have my chest tape here, and I'm using it to regulate the height of the collar right now. So um, this line that I'm drawing is going to be the center back of the collar. Now I'm starting by drawing a relatively straight line, and then I'm going to shape it a little bit. And this fully depends on how much curvature you've managed to tailor into your collar itself uh, on the main body of the garment. Once I have the center back line drawn, then I'm going to measure out toward the front and I'm going to back this up just a little bit so that I can see where my end point is. So if IQ is the length that I'm making it, that times 2 equals IIM, which then equals the measurement that I used when I actually measured the collar. So I know it's a little odd to think about mathematics in terms of these letters, but once you have some practice with the Bada system, hopefully it will become second nature. Now I'm going to adjust the lay of the fabric here so that I can just draw these lines. I, I'm well practiced, so I know I make it look easy. Uh, if you really want to, you can draft a pattern first and then pin it down and trace it. I often don't. I just put it on the paper, put it on the fabric, and cut and go. So I'm just cutting out the collar here, uh, collar lining, and uh, then it's going to take a second to fold and put away the fabric. Now, here's what we do is we got to prepare this for us to stitch. So I'm looking at the center back. The center back is, um, you know, pointing to the left right now, and the top of the collar is toward the bottom, uh, pointing toward the bottom of the screen. So the neckline edge is the narrower edge on this. And I know that some people have had issues figuring out which end of the collar goes up. So the curved side, the one that that looks like the bottom of a modern collar, that's actually the outer edge. The structure is a little bit different than what we use in modern clothing. So I'm going to just use some linen basting thread and baste this seam in place before stitching it. And this is again basting a little bit further away from the edge than where I would stitch. And then I'll take this over to the workbench and I'll sit down and we'll just give it some good strong back stitching. To begin the seam, I will start by tying in my thread right here. And then I'll work a stem stitch from left to right for a couple of inches. Once I've uh, reached a couple of inches, that means that I will have enough fabric to control it when, once I turn it over and start working a standard back stitch from right to left. But one of my big pet peeves, which I've said multiple times, is I don't like starting a back stitch seam from the right hand edge of the fabric because it leaves the fabric um, out of the grip of like my palms. You look at my right hand, you can see how I plant my hand to hold the fabric in a slight tension as I work. If I can't do that, then uh, I feel like my stitching isn't going to be as accurate. So um, you don't necessarily have to do it the way that I'm doing it, I'm just explaining why I use that method. You can see we've clearly skipped ahead a little bit, and now the seam is almost stitched. These stitches were made very small and very close together because the fabric is thin and the needle would let us make a nice tiny stitch. And that's necessary because the silk is going to be abraded quite a bit being the inside of the collar. So small firm stitches are important to the longevity of this collar lining. 
So I want to clip my threads and then I'll press the edge and we can start uh, stitching it in. There's a little hiccup in the continuity here because I really wanted to show that I made a mistake when I was putting the collar lining in, in that uh, I put the collar lining completely in and had absolutely forgotten to put the collar button loops in place. So I have to go back and open the lining at the front and actually put those loops in place. And the reason that I am putting it here is because now would be the correct time to do this before the collar lining even goes in. Once the loops are in place, the collar lining goes in the same way as I was about to explain. The difference is, if you follow these directions, you won't have to unstitch the collar and take a step backwards the way I did. So I'm trusting that you'll learn from my mistake and do it in the right order. So without further ado, let's move on to what it's supposed to be. So you can see that I've peeled this open. I've made three little marks on the collar for the loops and I'm going to um, punch the holes using the awl and then I'm going to work the trim through so that I can use more of the black trim to form the button loops. And using the same trim as is trimming the garment is pretty common in surviving garments to, to create the loops. It's not easy to do though, you have to be careful. So I'm pushing it through and I can barely see a little bit of the black and I'm using the tip of my awl to just gently drag some of the trim through until I can grab it with my fingers and pull up a loop. Uh, you have to be careful because you don't want to shred the trim while you do this. So you have to be quick and you have to be precise. Um, thankfully this trim is pretty forgiving. It, it pops right through and uh, the length is basically making the loop go all the way to the outer edge and I have to make sure that I don't pull each successive one up short as I do it. So I measure each one as I do and then I hold the underlayers on the inside uh, in order to keep them in place so that I don't uh, worry about making a mistake and having a loop that's been yanked short by accident. Once all three loops are pulled to the outside and have been measured up to the correct length, we can cut our trim, so uh, set aside the excess, and then we can start stitching these loops in place. The way we do this is we focus on stitching on the inside and at the at each um, at each eyelet hole or punch hole we're going to just stitch the bits of trim right to the canvas surrounding the hole. Then we're going to follow the line of trim just down the front. You see it's right along the edge of the canvas here which is great because it will um, be slightly recessed. Uh, and so it won't add a lot of bulk to the inside of the collar. We are going to just stitch it down and I'll work my way here. I'm getting the second hole and then I'll work my way down to the third hole and the next thing I'll do is I'll secure the actual cut tails of the trim. And you want to be really careful and uh, strong with these stitches because there's a lot of tension that's put on these loops when they're fastened and unfastened. You're, you're pulling at them, you're moving them around a lot, and I tell you what, it's happened to me before where I didn't stitch them well enough on the inside and I go to fasten one of these buttons and I'll pull a loop of trim out of alignment or even pull the button loops completely out of the collar by accident. So you have to make certain that these are strong. Once I've stitched everything on the inside, I'm going to bring the needle and the thread through to the outside and I will take a series of small bar tacks across the end of the loop. And you can see that I'm doing this about an eighth of an inch away from where it comes out of the collar. And I'll take three or four stitches all in the same place to tack this down. And what it does is it forces the loop to lie down in the correct position. And I'll tunnel through to the next one and I'll come out here and then I'll stitch again and I'll do that a third time on the final one. And that just makes them all stay in position.
Once all three loops are secured in place, I'll plunge the thread back through to the inside and take a couple of stitches in one place and uh, tie off and cut. So now I'm beginning to baste the collar lining in place. And what I've done is I, I've stitched my center back seam on the collar, I've taken it to the iron and pressed the seam allowance open, and then I've proceeded to press uh, the seam allowance down on the top edge. So we're working with a fold along the top edge. When I pin this in place, I pin the center of the collar lining matching up to the center of the collar itself. And then just with my hands, I worked my way toward the right um, right side of the collar here and I've been basting it in place. Once the top is completely basted in place, then I'll begin securing the bottom edge of the collar lining. And this will be stitched directly to the seam allowances of the front neckline and collar join. When we get across the back, I'll have to stretch it a little bit and stitch very gingerly so that I don't go all the way through to the outside. But this is done with a diagonal baste and I'm doing it nice and low so that when the body lining is hemmed down onto the collar, I won't, uh, I won't see any of these stitches in place, so they can just stay where they are. But you can see I had to clip the center back seam a little bit, and I'm stretching the silk so that it helps to make the, the upper portion of it um, lie flat inside the collar. You can see there's the seam allowance, and then I'm stitching right into that seam allowance. It's almost like I'm doing a whip stitch around the edge of the allowance, only I'm going through the collar lining at the same time. With the lining completely in place, now we're going to start hemming it down onto the top of the button band. And this is where we really begin our work. It's a little tight at the base of the neck here, so I'm just clipping the seam allowance to release the tension a little bit. Then I will come along to the uh, edge of the collar and I'll mark where it's going to be. So you can see I've got my finger width in there and I'm marking somewhat to the outside of it so that I can trim away the excess silk and then just turn it to the inside and hem it down when the time comes. So that side's done and you can see right here I'm very carefully showing that you can wrap around the folded down seam allowance and poke this inside and you get a nice, tidy, clean lining join. Look at that. That's a really nice finish right there. And it makes it look clean, it makes it look precise and professional. And then the remaining lining, as you get below the neckline, can just uh, fall down inside the garment. You can leave it there, you don't have to trim it close or anything because the body lining will go on top of it. Now we're moving back over to the side where the buttonholes are because this is where the actual stitching begins. So here I am. You can see where everything lines up. I'm folding the collar lining back and laying it on top of the button band and then it will get hemmed across the top there. Here goes the stitching. One, two, Again, with linings, I really like to make the stitches small and secure because linings take a lot of abrasion and wear, so the smaller the felling stitches are, the better. And I also think when you're using a slightly contrasting thread like I am in this image, you really get uh, something that looks precise and clean and professionally made. As I reach the end here, I'm going to take a stitch and then turn the corner and work my way up the front of the collar. I have quite a bit that I have to fold in here. Made my mark, but I'm leaving a little bit of excess. Now, because of my mistake earlier, you're not seeing the button loops that would actually be here because I did this out of order and had to go back and add them later. But this is the step where you start closing the top of the collar above the buttonholes. And again, it's just basic felling stitches We'll reach the top corner, uh, we'll create the same kind of join that I showed you on the other side of the collar where it's folded neatly around the seam allowance and stitched across. So I'm opening the top here and I am making that corner very nice and clean. I'm just stuffing the lining down inside. 
you can see it wrapping around this seam allowance here. And I'm not even going to pin. I'm just going to hold it with my fingers and then grab my needle and thread and just stitch right through it to get all the way up. So here I go. One, two, three. And taking the final stitch right here, I'm going to just tunnel through the wool and head up to the top to make sure that the fold is, is closed all the way to the very top of the edge. And then I poke my needle back through into the lining from there. And then I turn and I begin felling the stitches across the top of the collar. You can see I'm kind of tugging this piece of bias down. It looks like it got a little loose and uh, sort of it's a uh, extending away from the width that it needs to be at. So I'm just using the needle to stuff it back down for a minute and stitch it in place. You can see as I get to the corner right here I'm making sure that I get all the layers of the silk in place and nail them down so that they don't move. I'm continuing with my felling stitches. I just uh, got a nice close-up shot here so you can see how those stitches are going all the way through, through the silk, through the Piccadilly strip, through to the wool and canvas layer beneath, and everything is very tight and secure. And this is how you want the top of this collar lining to be. Especially if you use this Piccadilly strip for pinning and arranging a ruff, you really want it to be nice and strong and you don't ever want it to come loose while you're in the middle of using it or wearing it. As I've worked my way across the top of the collar, I'm now at the opposite side and I've, I've tucked my lining in around the seam allowance just as we did at the beginning and now I'm working my way down the opposite side of the collar and this is where it finishes. We'll just proceed down here and reach the neckline and then we'll tie the threads off. The white basting that goes around the bottom can just stay there. It's not going to go anywhere, it's going to get covered by the body lining. So now we can proceed and move on to closing the body lining. So now we're going to begin basting the rest of the lining closed and we'll do this really quickly so that we can move on to the actual stitching. So we've already got the center front turned back and now I'm going to turn the neckline edge down and you can see here I'm just folding under a little bit of a seam allowance and when my fingers are on the back side I'm sort of feeling for placement of that seam allowance so that the folded edge should be even with the actual stitching line. And uh, now I'm just going to start basting and we're going to skip through really quickly. First I'm going to fold down and baste around this edge. Now the neckline's on the bias, be careful not to stretch it too much as you go around and then we're going to hit the shoulder and once we're to the shoulder, we're going to give the linen a little bit of a tug to stretch it into position, and then we're going to baste across inside, and just right next to the cut edge, we're basting this down onto the wool. We don't need to go any deeper than that, um, just because once the back is felled down onto the front, then the stitches will be much stronger and deeper. So we'll move from there, and we'll reach the armhole, and we'll turn under the same seam allowance here, and line it up just beyond the heavy back stitching that holds the gathers in place and we'll start basting our way down the armhole and around toward the side back seam. This is a little bit fussy because you're dealing with so much fabric in your hand. You've got the sleeve that's gathered, that's crunched up inside, you've got the body, and you can see that even I struggle with just getting it in the right position to be able to do the work. It sometimes doesn't seem like it ever sits in a good place for the stitching to happen. Anyway, you keep basting along the edge and then we'll reach the pit and we'll, everything should lay, lie nice and smoothly on the inside and we'll work our way around the bottom of the armhole and then we'll reach the back and we'll clip our thread and move on. Now we'll begin the actual stitching. I have my white linen thread in my hand. I'm going to tunnel through a little bit and I'll take two stitches in one place so I don't have to have a knot here at center front where I'll be fastening and unfastening constantly. So I'll begin my felling stitches. I'll begin them with tight 
small, closely set stitches. And I'll work my way up the neckline here, around the neckline at the top. As we proceed around the neckline, we'll reach the shoulder, which has already been basted across in place, and break the stitching and skip across over to the armhole. And then we'll begin felling down the armhole as well. The stitch doesn't change, the technique doesn't change, and we just keep going around every single edge, securing it to itself and securing it to the lining. And we'll reach the bottom of the armhole. Now here, I sometimes like to get the stitches even closer and tighter together and make sure that I get them into the actual canvas as much as possible. The armpit takes an awful lot of abrasion during wear, more so than most other parts of the garment. Plus, you get uh, sweat decaying the threads and fibers, so you want to make sure that you, uh, you do it extra well. Then, as we reach the uh, long seam allowance that we have inside, I'm just securing it in place, and then I'll tie off, and we'll move on to stitching across the bottom. Again, there's no great mystery to how this works. We're just securing the edge with felling stitches right down onto the canvas of the lacing strip. We've already done the hard part by basting it all in place, now we just have to execute. When this side is done, then we repeat the exact same process on the opposite side. We'll have to start at the shoulder first, work our way across the neckline, then we'll work our way down the center front edge and across the bottom. And then we tie off and cut. And then the next step is hemming the back lining in place. And it's just hemmed down right on top of the edges of all of the fronts. In this step, we're going to close the back lining onto the front lining, and this will be the end of the major hand sewing of the construction of the garment. So we begin by just folding the bottom lining, and you can see at the bottom of my fingers, you can see there's this little extra pleat below, and that's my ease for movement. I'm going to baste this across, and I'll baste up the back, and just get it in place, folding all of the allowances in, in exactly the same way that we did for the fronts. Nothing has changed, the process is exactly the same. Going up the side back seam is ever so slightly trickier though, because you have to make sure that you don't go all the way through to the outside. And you can see we're just speeding along here, going up the side back seam, and then we'll turn and we'll go around the armhole, and we just keep doing it, and once it's all basted in place, then we go through and we will do all of the stitching and uh, fell it in place, and then it'll be done. The next thing we'll do is remove all of the basting stitches that are holding everything in place because they're no longer needed. This may be, hands down, my favorite part of the entire process, taking out all of the basting stitches that have, up to this point, held everything in place and uh, given us the freedom to handle this garment as much as we have. Some of them have been removed during the process, some of them we've put in during the process, like in the middle of a step, but we're just going to work our way backwards. So first the big basting stitches came out of the lining and now we're taking out all of the basting stitches that held the edges of the lining in place as we started stitching it. and. Um, it's very cathartic. I like doing this with an awl because I feel like I can get very easily underneath each stitch and pull. Some people like doing this with their fingers. Other people just cut them and pull them in little tiny chunks. Whatever way you decide to do it, it is fun and it is easy and it's very satisfying to know that this is what happens when you are completely done with the garment. One of the more important steps is to uh, stitch the eyelets at the waist of the center front. And you can see that I'm using two eyelets above and one below the waist seam. These eyelet marks are set back a little bit from the edge so that I'm not working through quite so much seam allowance. There are eyelets in extant garments in this location which are done through incredible thicknesses of fabric. I like to avoid that whenever possible. So you stretch the hole open with the awl, 
you use your silk finishing thread, the same thread you use for the buttonholes, and you literally just whip stitch around the edge of the hole. You stretch it open, you stitch it, and then at the end I will go through and stretch them one more time with the awl and make sure that they're uh, solid and open and easy to use. I use a tapered awl specifically so that I can push harder and stretch wider because the hole likes to close up as you're working it. And the stitching helps hold it open. And once it's complete, then you can move on to the next one. You stretch it open as well. And I usually just tunnel through the fabric until I get to it. I think that these hand-sewn eyelets don't need to be as uh, impressively neat as a lot of people try to make them. If you really look closely at eyelets on menswear in this time period, they are fast and dirty. All they're trying to do is keep the hole open. They're not trying to make it look pretty. It's very functional. And because the lacing that goes through it is pretty, when you're looking at a garment with eyelet holes, you generally don't see the hole. You see what's going through the hole. So now that that one's done, I tunnel through to the next, and so on, and it just keeps going. Next, we have to clip the Picadill strip at the collar, and this I usually do in about half-inch distances, maybe three-eighths of an inch, and I'll just clip all the way across exactly the same distance, like a little machine. And then when I'm done, I actually go through and intentionally rough up the edge. A lot of people are worried about fraying, but you don't put cuts straight into a piece of silk and leave them raw if you're expecting them not to fray a little bit. So this beautiful two-color silk shantung that I'm using for the Piccadilly strip, it comes to life when you rub the edges a little bit and make it uh, bloom so that the threads can be seen. Our next step is to mark the placement of the buttons, which will be sewn onto the front. Now, I'm going to specifically show you the way that I like to do it. There are many different methods, but I find this one to be fast and accurate. Um, one of the more interesting things is that the, the process, because we know our seam allowances, has enabled us to work through this entirely by hand. But if you've had some practice, it's always surprising to me how even everything remains at the end of the work. Uh, I'm always surprised that the fronts are the same length. I'm always surprised that nothing has really changed shape. And I think that's just um, not to say that I'm awesome, but I think it's a testament to good practice. So you work your way down the center front, marking each particular button, and then to sew it on, you take a double strand of your silk, you find your mark, and you take two stitches to lock it in place, just like this. And then you grab the thread covered button and you turn it over so that you're working on the bottom. And what I like to do is I like to cross one of the ribs in this style of button and I leave a shank that's about three quarters of an inch long and then I draw it up so that I have maybe three sixteenths of an inch to three eighths of an inch of de depth uh, between the button and the body. And then I'll twist the button and then I'll go through uh, another stitch, turn the button, take another stitch through another spine, and alternately take a stitch through the body. Once I have all of those stitches there, it's usually about 8 to 12 strands that are connecting. Then I will wrap the shank of the button about 5 or 6 times very, very tightly. I'm holding on to this extremely tight. And you can see me yank it and pull it, and that gives a very stiff, and very solid shank to the button. See that right there? And it ends up being about a quarter of an inch long because of the take up around the shape of the button. To finish off, I just take two stitches around all of the stitches that are going over the edge and um, then clip and move on. I think you'll notice that we aren't putting the button directly on the flat surface of the fabric but on the edge because this is the proper historical treatment for the button. Occasionally you'll see buttons that have been put on the flat surface of the garment, but it's rare. Thank you so much for joining me in this 10 video series of the Modern Maker Workroom. This has been the Bergen Doublet. I'm Matthew Nagy, and happy stitching. <laughs>